video we discuss general map projections, the cylindrical, conic, and planar map projections. In this video, we're going to look at some popular maps that you will encounter in human geography, and we're going to address some of the pros and cons of each. In order to do this, we're going to use a Mario Kart style flash profiles in order to help us understand the, and remember the usefulness and purposes of each map. But rather than use speed, acceleration, weight, handling, and traction, we're going to use the four main factors that maps try to preserve when it comes to limiting distortion, that is, distance, direction, size, and shape. As a general disclaimer, this measure I'm referring to is to help promote general knowledge of the maps and is not to be taken as a scientific measure, but if you want to hash it out with me in the comments, please feel free to let me know how right or wrong I am. Let's get started. Perhaps the most famous map in America is the Mercator map. Created by Gerardus Mercator in 1569, this map hangs in thousands of classrooms across the country. I guess that when we hear the word map, our brains probably just immediately visualize this particular projection. This map is a cylindrical map. The equator regions are seen very much as they would if you held a globe out in front of you and began to spin it around. You will notice though on your globe that it becomes hard to see the earth due to its curvature. So what Mercator did was extend the map up and out, which caused the map to stretch in order to make it look right on a flat surface. Because of the way he did this, the longitude lines appear to be parallel, and the latitude lines get wider the further north and south you go on the map. This causes a great deal of distortion. Despite the distortion, however, the map serves a very useful and practical purpose. It preserves direction, meaning that a straight line between any two points on the map was indeed a straight line on the Earth's surface as well. And for this reason, the map was used for navigation. It's also worth noting that the map makes countries further up to the north look really, really big compared to how they actually are. Is Greenland the same size as Africa? Probably half of you students watching this right now have lived with this misconception until right now. Well, I'm about to prove to you that it is not. In fact, Greenland is about the size of Algeria, which is only one country in Africa. And we know that Africa is the second largest continent in the world, so wouldn't Greenland be a continent if it were really that big? Greenland is actually this big, and Africa is actually this big. This distortion has social and cultural implications as well. It kind of makes European countries look dominant, while making countries from the developing world appear marginal. While countries on the economic periphery are on the outside of the global economy, many geographers criticize the American projection for this. Which makes sense because so many students in the developed world grow up thinking that they take up more land area than the hundreds of millions of people living on or south of the equator. To measure this one up on its stats, the Mercator map projection tops the charts on direction. As we've already discussed, this is the primary purpose of the map. I'm going to give it an average 3 on distance because distortion in the poles as well as parallel longitude lines cause the shape to be a little bit misleading. Distance is especially distorted when connecting two dots from north to south. On size and shape, the Mercator projection gets a 1. To counter the Eurocentric implication of the Mercator projection, the Gulf Peters projection was developed in order to preserve the land area of the equatorial regions relative to the land area of the northern and southern regions. What you get is an accurate size depiction, but a ridiculously odd-shaped appearance to both the elongated countries along the equator as well as the seemingly squished northern and southern countries. Critics make this assertion, and they also note that the longitude lines are parallel, which forces an elongation of land masses and causes distortion in the regions of the Earth that contain the highest density of the global population. This map gives a 5 on accurate size based on land area, but would really score low on everything else. I give it a 1 on distance, direction, and shape. This one here would be for advanced gamers only if this were Mario Kart. The Good Homolocene map, or Good Interrupted Projection, is another map that you're going to see a lot in geography textbooks. As a matter of fact, it's used a lot in the Faubourg and Dublay book that many of you might be using as your primary text for your human geo class. It was created by a dude named John Paul Good in 1925 and is great for showing the distribution of geospatial data. It attempts to preserve land size by creating interruptions in the map that account for the Earth's curved surface. And still there are some problems with land and shape in the northern latitudes and the obvious distortion caused by the interruption. Sorry Greenland, you can use this map to see land area, which is usually the case, but interestingly, you can use this map projection to highlight oceans as well. 
So how does this one rank? Well, we're gonna give it a four out of five on preserving shape and a four out of five on preserving size, but just a one on preserving distance and direction due to the map's interruptions. The Robinson projection is next. Developed by Arthur H. Robinson, this is another classroom favorite because it was adopted and heavily used by the map company Ram McNally. The Robinson projection is one that does everything pretty well but does nothing perfect. The map uses curved lines of longitude to replicate the curvature of the round earth. So as long as you're looking at land masses that are kind of mostly in the center of the map as a whole, the size of the areas are going to be fairly well accurate like the Arctic globe. However, northern latitudes still look larger and the shape is very distorted because the areas on the outside of the map still has to be flattened out to make any sense to the reader. So if you look at Canada, Russia, or Greenland, or even Australia, you can quickly see some of the distortion I'm referring to. And still, this is a very useful and popular map as seen in many textbooks and classroom walls across the country. This would be the Mario in Mario Kart. Straightforward all the way and good for beginners. I give it a 4 out of 5 on shape and size and a 3 out of 5 on distance and direction. And keep in mind that a straight line on this map is not a straight line on the Earth's surface. The next map I'm going to discuss is the Winkle Triple Projection. On first glance, you may look at this and think, oh, it's a Robinson projection, but take a closer look at the lines of latitude on the left and on the right hand sides of the map, and you're going to see the main difference. The map's lines allow to both north and south in the northern and southern hemispheres in order to preserve a round appearance. This allows the polar regions to have less size and shape distortion. Notice how Greenland looks way more normal in terms of size and shape. Even Antarctica is beginning to look a little bit more like an like a actual landform than a big giant white blob. Oswald Winkle was looking to minimize what he considered to be the three biggest distortion factors that existed on flat maps of the world at the time. That is, area, direction, and distance. In regard to this, he did a pretty decent job. Starting in 1998, the National Geographic Society began using this projection over the Robinson projection. On Mario Kart scale, this is going to be our highest scoring overall, with a straight 4 out of 5 on each measurement factor. This one is going to be considered OP and would be widely considered to be cheap in tournaments, kind of like Nightmare in Soul Calibur. Finally, the last map projection I wanted to discuss with you is the North-South Planar Projections. Just like we discussed in our last video, the Planar Projections are simply a top-down look at a round Earth. This projection is great for looking at the polar regions, and really, this is the only way to look at the polar regions without seeing a ton of distortion. Notice that on a top-down planar projection, Antarctica looks like it does on the globe. We finally are able to see what Antarctica looks like. We probably see these maps the least because we don't usually need to isolate the polar regions for a general study of geography, but when you do, this one is the one to use. Also notice that South America, Africa, and Australia show up, but they don't look right, and this is because the further you get from the center of the map on a planar projection, the more distortion comes into view. Just like if you were looking at a round globe, there comes a point you can no longer see the other continents because of the round surfaces of the Earth. You can sometimes see a planar projection used for showing other parts of the Earth, but this is not the norm. On our Mario Kart scale, this was going to score low overall because of its limited use, but it really is strong at looking at polar regions. So, we're going to say that as long as you're looking at the polar regions, it's going to be a solid 5 out of 5 on shape and size, and a 3 out of 5 on distance and direction. So there you have it. Your brief rundown of the uses and strengths of some of our most popular map projections in human geography. Hope you found the video helpful. And don't forget to like and subscribe and be back for the next video, the third in the series. A breakdown of political, physical, and thematic maps. Peace out students.